And uh, she said that uh, everyone sits on the floor uh, where they had this service. And uh, they were given instructions on how they will be ministering. And they gave my wife some bad news that uh, because of the prevailing religion in that country, she will not have the privilege of praying for anyone, even believers. Because in that country, they believe that if you have a dark skin, you came from, you live a bad life before. That's why you came back in incarnation, you came back dark instead of light skin. So you have bad luck, so you cannot pray for anyone. So, <laughs> and so even believers, they said even believers still have that belief. And in this country, most of you already know what I'm talking about, but you, if you are a black person, you cannot minister to the ones who have a light skin. Uh, but there are pastors who have a light skin, and in fact, one of our popular speakers in this church from that country, is uh, dark skin, uh, and uh, we love him here, but when he goes back to his country, uh, he has a challenge ministering to everyone. So please pray for uh, a fast lady, that's not uh, an easy place to be. No freedom. In fact, uh, they speak with court languages, even on the phone, uh, you use court languages because it's uh, a dangerous uh, place. Now, was she aware? Yeah, they were aware. In fact, they were told, make sure you are in agreement with your family that you may not come back. So make sure they are okay if you don't get to come back. Uh, there are four of them, and uh, they arrived safely, and... Uh, Keep our in prayers. So because it's difficult, a difficult place, uh, we know that God is able to do anything. So Brother Ian, if you can lead us again in who has a final say. So no matter what's happening, we know that God has the final say. So why don't we sing that song as we remember uh, my wife. And uh, I... No, it was not announced here, but we would like to compile a list of those who are interested in going to Israel next year, spring. We have not uh, identified the dates, but it has to be somewhere between January and March next year. So please uh, give your name to uh, Naziri, or call the office and give your name, uh, or give your name to Brother He and Ian. Uh, we want to know how many people would like to go. Before we invite other people from other churches, we want to make sure that uh, we have uh, everyone here covered. We need at least 19, uh, 15 to 19, max uh, 40, I believe it's 44. Uh, so let us know. It's going to be a very, very interesting trip. And uh, because we are starting early, you can be able to contribute your money uh, slowly by slowly, so that by uh, December, you are done. Amen? Amen. Mm -hmm. So last a question, and you answer. Are we together? Who has the final say? Who has the final say? Who has the final say? I cannot hear you. I ask, who has the final say?
has the final say. Jehovah has the final say. I ask who has the final say. Jehovah has the final say. I ask who has the final say. Oh, we can do better than that. I ask who has the final say. Jehovah, oh great Jehovah, he turned the Lord for us, and he makes, he makes the way when there is no way, Jehovah has the final say, Jehovah, final say. Amen. I know most of you are probably wondering, you are okay for your wife if she doesn't come back? Well, you know when a time comes, you can exit from anywhere, here or there, wherever it is. Amen. So when a time has come, it's not the issue of where. Amen? Amen. 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 Let us pray. Father, we thank you for this moment. We are grateful for your love for us, your care for us. We know, Father, that you are a great God. There is nothing that is impossible before you. And so we pray for Elizabeth and her team, where they are in the mission field that is very difficult, very dangerous. There is nothing that is impossible before you. So we pray that you open doors for ministry to them, and we pray that you use them and protect them. We ask that you protect them from any danger, protect them from any diseases. And we pray, Father, that you will bring them back to us safely. And now, Lord, as we turn to hear your word, we pray, Father, that you will teach us. Enlighten our, our minds with thy Holy Spirit. Reveal to us the deep truths in your word. Enable us to understand by teaching us through thy Holy Spirit. I stand here, O oh God, by the vessel, so I pray that you'll use me for your own glory. In the name of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ, and all the saints say, Amen. You may be seated. Thank you. Give a hand to our worship team. Amen. Amen. Now, in your notes, uh, page one, the first page, Actually, are the notes from, from last week, 1 through 8. Now, the next page is the numbers are a little bit off. So, on the first page, the second page, the first letter should be number 9, which is X, 1 and X, numeral 1 and X. Uh, I did not notice that until the last uh, uh, few minutes. So one of the things I learned about where uh, my wife is at the moment is that they are ahead of us 11 and a half hours. I've never had anything like that. I thought if it is, they are ahead, it's only 6, 5, 10, 12, 15, but 11 and a half? So when I actually... Uh, I like that that place in my phone, the wall, mar or wall clock, it actually showed that they are ahead of us 11 and a half hours. I'm thinking to myself, I guess I need to go back to class, still to learn astronomy or paleontology. Uh, Dr. Sang, which one do I need to learn? <laughs> I realize there's many things that we still need to learn about our planet. I thought I knew it all. But it looks like as we continue, there are many things that we are going to learn about our planet. This week, they said science, scientists are now recommending that the planes fly at least 2,000 higher than where it has been flying. 
for fuel efficiency and also to reduce the hair pollution. I say that if they do that, it is going to reduce the pollution made by the airplanes by 90%. So these are new things. They are discovering new things, how they can make things run better for us. I believe that is also the same way when it comes to Scripture. You realize that it doesn't matter how long you've been a believer. It doesn't matter how long you've studied the Scripture. You realize there are many new things that you continue to discover. In fact, you will read a passage today and tomorrow when you go back to read. You, you discover things that you never re- read or seen the previous day. It goes to tell us that we can never exhaust God's word. You can read it, you can study, but you will never be able to exhaust it. There's always something new for us. And so today we continue to discover the benefits of reading God's word. Now, if you look in your notes, you look at it and say, Pastor, this is a lot. How are we going to do this uh, in one sermon? Well, that's the point. The point is, there are many that you cannot be able to exhaust it. And so as an illustration of how much it is, I have given you, there are 20 of them, we did 8 last week. So the remaining is 12, I'm actually going to focus on only 3 of them. But we will read the rest. And as Jesus Christ said, let he who has the hear, hear what the Spirit is telling the church. So anything I didn't explain, you will read the passage and let anyone who asks they hear, hear what the Spirit is telling his people. Amen? So number nine, it will give you assurance of salvation. Scripture makes it clear who is born again. And if you are born again, Scripture will give you evidence that you are born again. It is not something you live in this life and then when you die, you discover whether you are a believer or not. Now this is what one of the things that distinguishes Christianity from other religions. Other religion, you ask them if they know they are going to heaven, they say, God knows. Scripture makes it clear, if you are born again, it is clear that you are born again. Let us read 1 John chapter 5, verse 11 and 12. And this is the testimony. God has given us eternal life, and this life is in his Son. Whoever has the Son ha- has life. Whoever does not have the Son of God does not have life. It's clear, if you have the Son of God... You have life because God has given us this eternal life. And this life is in his son. If you have the son of God, then you have life. John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. The gospel of John chapter 20, verse 30 and 31. It says, Jesus performed many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not recorded in this book. Did you know that? Christ performed many other miracles that are not recorded in this book. But then it says in verse 31, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing you may have life in his name. If you believe in Jesus, you have life. In his name. John chapter 5 verse 24. Very truly I say, I tell you. Whoever hears my word and believes him who sent me has eternal life. And will not be judged but has crossed over from death to life. So in that verse it says there are three things that happen to anyone who believes in Jesus. First, you have eternal life and it's present tense. You have it now. You will not be church. 
future, no judgment. And then past, you have crossed from death to life. Three things that happen to you instantly when you give your life to Jesus. And then Romans chapter 8, verse 14. Uh, John chapter 1, verse 12 first. And to those who received him, he gave them power to become children of God. If you have given your life to Jesus, you are a child of God. And then lastly, Romans chapter 8, verse 14 through 15. Yet to all who did receive him, to those who believe in his name, he gave the right to become children of God. That is John 1, 12. About assurance of salvation. Romans chapter 8, verse 14. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. And that's important. For those who are led by the Spirit of God are the children of God. The spirit you receive does not make you slaves so that you live in fear against. Rather, the spirit you receive brought about your adoption to sonship. And by this or by him, we cry, Abba, Father. So believers are led by the spirit of God. That by itself tells you you are a child of God. If you read in that passage, it says it, that spirit witnesses with our own spirit that we are sons of God. But then it says, because of this spirit also, we cry, Abba, Father. Now, did you know that only believers can say, Abba, Father? Only believers can call God, Abba, Father, because they are sons and daughters of God. Unbelievers cannot say that. But we can say that. If you are a believer, you can say, Abba, Father. You can say, Father, who is in heaven. Therefore, if you have given your life to Jesus, Scripture is very clear that you are now a child of God. You belong to the family of God. That is why scripture tells us in Colossians chapter 3, we are citizens of heaven. We are foreigners in this world, Peter says. Our citizenship is in heaven. Number 10, it will give you joy. Psalms 19 verse 8. Psalms 19 verse 8 says, the precepts of the Lord are right. Giving joy to the heart. The commands of the Lord are radiant, giving light to the eyes. Next verse, Jeremiah 15, 16. Jeremiah 15, 16. When your words came, Jeremiah says, I ate them. They were my joy and my heart's delight, for I bear your name. Lord God Almighty, God's word will give you joy. Part of depression is lack of joy in life. You don't have any joy. If you're looking for, to deal with depression, read God's word. For it will give you joy in your life. Number 11, and this is one of the three that I will focus a little bit. God's word will judge your thoughts and the intention of your heart. And the writing is a little bit different from what it is there. So you have to change it and write. It will judge your thoughts and the intention of your heart. Hebrews chapter 4 verse 11. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 12. 
It reads, for the word of God is alive and active, sharper than any double-edged sword. It penetrates even to the dividing soul and spirit, joints and marrow. It judges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The first part of this verse, we will examine that next week as we deal with the characteristics of the word. But I want to deal with the second part. It says it charges the thoughts and attitudes of the heart. The word that is used here to describe the word as a judge is kritikos. And it's a very interesting word because it's only used here once in the Bible. That means it is that important that it had to be used in here and it was, it has, it was only used once in the Bible. It is where we get our English word critique. It's criticos. God's word is criticos. God's word is the ultimate measuring stick for our moral standards. Your spiritual, the, heart, the spiritual condition of your heart can only be determined by God's word. As to how spiritual you are, it's only God's word that can judge that. It discerns your heart. And nothing is hidden before him. In verse 13 it says, Nothing in all creation is hidden from God's sight. Everything is uncovered and laid bare before the eyes of him to whom we must give an account. So before God there is nothing in hidden in you. In fact the word used there is naked. It's just naked. So you might look, you're dressed up. But inside you, it's naked before God. God sees everything in you. So God's word is the one that critiques or discerns what is in our hearts. Now it says it will judge your thoughts. It will charge your thoughts by revealing your distorted view of morality. In other words, God's word will judge your moral understanding. What you believe to be right and what you believe to be wrong. It will judge to let you know whether your belief is right or wrong. You know, nowadays we are in an age whereby whatever was wrong is now right. Whatever was bad is now good. And it's hard to convince this generation to tell them that this is wrong. Because what, they, what we say is wrong, they say it's right. What we say is bad, they say it's good. But scripture will judge that understanding. It judges that moral understanding. And shows how def uh, defective that it is. For what is See you next Sunday. And what he has said, this is wrong. That's what will judge. Oh, by the way. God not only judges your
are your motivations? Uh, first chapter 4, verse 5 tells us that in the end, Why you suffer? God has called you to to do. Are you there to show up? Show up? Deeper to convict your thoughts. reason why missionary to Africa some of the chiefs how to But one of the chiefs said, no. I was asked why. He said, I don't want to change my mind. Like Chief Sekele. Apparently, Chief Sekele had read the Bible and became a believer. Instead of more than one wife. So this other chief told David Livingston. But after I have married five wives. But until. Power. Through thirty three. If you hold to my teaching, you are disciples. They answered him. How can you say that we shall be set free? Very, really, very truly, I tell you, everyone who sins is a slave to sin. In other words, if you are living in sin, you are a slave. But if you know the truth, the truth will set you free. Because once you know that you are a slave to sin, then you will seek freedom. 
But there's another aspect of this uh, truth giving you freedom. Part of knowing the truth will be false teaching. People who follow cults or cult teachers are enslaved to false teaching. And what they are desperate for is the truth because the truth will set them free. Now, unfortunately, all what they are doing is that they are not reading the Bible for themselves. All they are saying is that this is what my teacher says. This is what the prophet says. By the way, that's a very dangerous statement. If all you are saying is that this is what my pastor says, this is what my prophet says, this is what my teacher says, you are endangering yourself. Because if your teacher, your prophet, your pastor misleads you, that means you'll just follow and follow and follow and follow. But if you read the word, the word will set you free. The reason why Reformation was started by Martin Luther is because Martin Luther read the word. And the word set him free. And he started the Reformation. So, you will not believe what's happening in the world. There are many, but I would like to give you one if you have not seen in South Africa one of the prophets or a pastor teaching his congregants. So, media, if we can see that video. Now here's a preacher telling his congregation to go eat grass. Eat quickly. Today, no time, no time. You eat quickly. Limited time today. Okay, rewind to the beginning because I want to see the pastor. Be quiet. Still go back. Now, I get, we are supposed to eat the bread, but they're going to eat special bread before they eat this. If can you Jesus go back a little bit into one, so you can be able to fish see him? Into his body, oh, there he is. Huh? Loaves from Notice the he has a pulpit into and a what? keyboard. Into what? Into his body. People can they even eat. have worship team. See the mics. So I'm going to give them food from above. And they're going to eat for this year, 2014. Huh? Huh? Happy we are fasting, but they're going to eat the fulfillment from above. Wake up! Stand up! Stand up! Upright! Attention! Now that Close reaction to that command, I'm not sure what's happening. Something very unusual okay, about I that. I see food outside. Look at that. Look at that food. Be quiet. Be quiet. Okay, go and eat. Go and eat. Go eat outside. Go, quickly. Eat quickly. Eat quickly. 
Today, no time. No time. You eat quickly. Limited time today. Well, end there. Now, where is that written in scripture? Is there anywhere that says we need to go out and eat grass? But the pastor tells them, go eat grass, and they believe. They can do anything he says. In fact, there is another one. Uh, I won't show you that now, but there's another one that when he, he comes, everyone kneels down and they bow down. I mean, it's crazy. I mean, it's like God has arrived. Read the scripture. You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. Amen? You will know the truth and the truth will set you free. So that you do not follow false teachers. Amen? Okay, let's go to number 13. It will make you wiser. Proverbs chapter 4, verse 11. It will make you wiser. Instruct you. What is that? Okay. I instruct you in the way of wisdom and lead you along straight paths. God's word will instruct you in the way of wisdom. Psalm 119, verse 98. Your commands are, all, are always with me and make me wiser than my enemies. God's word will make you wise. By the way, wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge into your life. Wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge to your life. Have you seen smart people who are smart up here? But they do dumb stuff. Why? Because they don't have wisdom. Wisdom is the ability to apply knowledge into correctly, to apply knowledge correctly into your life. Number 14. It will guide you. Now most of us know Psalms uh, 119, Psalms 105. Thy word is a light unto my feet. Thy word is a light unto my feet. Uh, first 30, 130. The unfolding of your words give li gives light. It gives understanding to the simple. God's word will show us there is only one way to heaven. There's no other way. It's only one. Acts chapter 4, verse 12 says, There's only one name that has been given that man shall be safe. That is Jesus. God's word guides us in how to live this new life in Christ. You must use the handbook of the new life. God's word shows us how to treat each other. We must love one another and bear with each other's burdens. God's word shows us how to deal with our enemies. It will guide you. Number 15, it will save you. James chapter 1, verse 21. It will save you. Therefore, get rid of all moral filth and the evil that is so prevalent and humbly accept the word planted in you, which can save you. Number 16, it will heal your body. Now, this is powerful. Did you know that God's word can heal your body? Proverbs chapter 4, verse 20 through 22. My son, pay attention to what I say. Turn your ears to my words. Do not let them out of your sight. Keep them within your heart. For they are life to those who find them and health to one's whole body. 
It's health to one's own body. It's the power of God's word. Number 17. It will show you your purpose in life. Ephesians chapter 2, verse 10. For we are God's workmanship created before the foundation of God's... Let me read that again. For we are God's handiwork created in Christ Jesus to do good works, which God prepared in advance for us to do. Each one of us, God has something already prepared for you before the foundation of the earth for you to do while you are here on earth. Gives you the purpose in life. You have an assignment to fulfill. You've heard me say this. There are three things that are true for a believer. God has an assignment for you, which was created before the foundation of the earth. Secondly, God has given you a gift that will enable you to fulfill that purpose or that assignment. Third, in some way or another, God has prepared you. If you look back to your experience, if you look back to where you've come from, the school you went, the people you work with, in some way or another, God was preparing you for this particular purpose. Scripture will show you your purpose in life. Number 13. 13 no, 18. It will cause fruitfulness. You want to flourish as a Christian? You want to flourish spiritually? Only God's word will cause that fruitfulness. Psalms 1, verse 2 through 3. It reads, But those who delight in the law of the Lord, and who meditate on his law day and night, that person is like a tree planted by the streams of water, which yields its fruit in season, and whose leaves does not wither. Whatever they do prospers. As I said earlier, some of this I will not explain. Let he who has the hear, let him hear what the Spirit says to his people. Number 19. Our prayers will be answered. God's word teaches us how to pray so that our prayers will be answered. First John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. Actually, uh, let's, be- let's begin with John 15, verse 7. If you remain in me and my words remain in you, ask whatever you wish and it will be done for you. Christ says, If you remain, if you abide in me, and my words abide in you, ask whatever you wish, and it will be done for you. It shows us how our prayers can be answered by abiding in the word or remaining in the word. Now, it shows also here that there's a possibility that there's an option that you may choose not to remain in the word or remain in him and or remain in the word. But if you choose, then your prayers will not be answered. But if you abide in him and his words abided in you, then your prayers will be answered. You say, ask whatever you want and it will be done for you. First John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. First John chapter 5, verse 14 and 15. This is the confidence we have in approaching God. That is, this is the confidence we have when we are praying. When we go to God in prayer, says, this is the confidence we have. What's the confidence? That if we ask anything according to His will, He hears us. We have this confidence that if I ask according to His will, He will answer my prayer. How do we know God's will? Through Scripture. So God's word will show you what is God's will. 
so that you can ask according to his will. Jesus Christ gave us an example in Luke chapter 22, verse 41 and 42. At the garden of Gethsemane, as he was praying when he was about to be arrested, knowing and seeing exactly what was going to go through, the pain that he was going to go through, Jesus Christ prayed. He withdrew about a stone's throw beyond them, knelt down and prayed, Father, if you are willing, take this cup from me. Yet not my will, but your will, yours be done. Christ said, I know what's about to happen. I can see. I know the pain. He said, Lord, Father, remove this cup. But not my will, but thy will be done. In other words, if you desire for me to go through this, I will. But if it is your will for me to be rescued from this, then rescue me. Praying according to God's will. I know there are people who are praying. I say, Lord, I've been praying to you and you are not listening to me. Well, you are praying according to your will, but not his will. Pray according to his will. May your will be done. And then lastly, it's one of the other ones that I needed to spend time. It will bring success to your life. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Joshua chapter 1 verse 8. Is that in the New Testament or Old Testament? Old Testament. Thank you. Do not let this book of the Lord depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night, so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Wow. That reminds me, I gave you an assignment last week to read the book of Esther and tell me the uniqueness. So let me take a break and ask. <laughs> Who has an answer? What is unique about the book of Esther if you read it? Where is your aunt? Hey, hold on. I need. I don't see ants. I actually don't want to give Monica and Ian. Who is that to raise the hand there? Okay. Okay. I did not hear. It's the way um, the plan was planned from beginning to um, to kill the children of Israelites. That was the enemy was planning. That was um, okay. Mordecai. Okay. Mordecai. Mordecai okay. was planning mm -hmm. what he was planning for the mm. children of Israel. So um, God used um, the things that were meant to destroy them for their good through Esther. Uh, I don't know how. Okay. Well, thank you. Thank you. That's good summary. Give a hand. Give a hand. Okay. I'm looking for the right answer. Kilonso, no. Um. Um. Is it the fasting and prayer? How no. Works? No. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Okay. Well, let me. Who, let me see. Who are the hands? Let me see what I can give. PT is a. Uh, why are you looking on your cell phone? <laughs> <laughs> okay, let me give to um, one of our young adults. Anyone else first? Let me see. Okay, say it and then we'll hear what PT has to say. In the book of Esther, the name of God is not mentioned. That is the uniqueness of the book of Esther. And yet, 
And yet, when you read the book of Esther, you can feel the presence of God. You can feel God moving, moving. You're like, God is right here all the way. It's a very interesting story. If you have never read it, go read the book of Esther. When you start it, you will not finish until the end. You think movies have drama? Read the book of Esther and you will see drama. Amen? Okay, let us go to the last one. God's word will give you success. Joshua chapter 1, verse 8. This is after, after Moses had died, God appointed Joshua to lead the children of Israel to the promised land. And see, so these are some of the instructions he gave it to him. Verse 8, he said, keep this book of the law always on your lips. Meditate on it day and night so that you may be careful to do everything written in it. Then you will be prosperous and successful. Then you will be prosperous and... Do you know that God's word will actually make you prosperous and successful? It will give you success, prosperous and successful. Do you want to be successful? Do you want to be prosperous? Then do what Joshua was told to do. Do not let this book of the law depart from your mouth. Meditate on it day and night. How does scripture do this? Because this is about talking about prosperous and successful. But let me highlight a few things on what scripture will teach you about economics. So, scripture will teach you God's kingdom economic, economics 101. This one is found in Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. But seek he first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these other things. And if you read what he's talking about is food, clothes, and money. Whatever you, the things that you need. He says, seek he first his kingdom and his righteousness and all these shall be added unto you. Proverbs chapter 3 verse 5 and 6 says, trust in the Lord with all your heart and and lean not, on your unders- uh, lean not on your own understanding. In all your ways acknowledge him. And he will make your paths straight. And God's kingdom economics 102 is found in Malachi. Once you have seek his kingdom. And then now he gives you all these things. God's economic 102 kicks in. Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. Bring the whole tithe into the storehouse, that there may be food in my house. Test me in this, says the Lord Almighty. And see if I will not throw open the floodgates of heaven and pour out so much blessing that there will not be room enough to store it. So give 10% of what you earn. Give your tithes to God. That is economic one or two. Once he's give, you figure out how you get it, when you get it, he say, give out what? The tithe. Now there's something I found here very interesting. Connected to the book of Hebrews, chapter 11, verse 11. Very interesting. And by faith, even Sarah, who was past childbearing age, was unable to bear children because she 
was enabled, was enabled to bear children because she considered him faithful who had made the promise. Even Sarah, who had passed childbearing age, was enabled to bear a child because he considered him faithful who made the promise. Now, put that together with Malachi chapter 3, verse 10 and 11. God says, if you give your tithes, I will. He said, test me. And you will see if I will not open the gates of heaven and bless you. So, if you, do, if you are not giving tithes, it is about your faith in God. Because Sarah believed that even though I have passed childbearing, this God who made a promise that he will give us a child will give me a child, will enable me to have a child. If you do not give tithes, if you are not giving tithes, what you are actually saying is this, God, I do not believe what you say. I do not believe you are faithful to your word. Because if I believe it, I could give you because I know you will do it. So if you are not giving your tithes, what in a sense you are saying is, I do not believe that God is faithful to his word. Because he said, if you give me, I will open the floodgates of heaven. So it is about faith. It is about your faith and God. It has nothing to do with the church. It has nothing to do with your pastor. It has all to do with your faith in God. Do you believe that he will open the floodgates of heaven and give you more? It is actually saying, if you are not giving your tithe, it's actually saying, I got what I got by myself. So why should I give it to you? I did it. I won't. So why should I give it to you? But if you recognize that the source of what you got is from him, then Eco Economics 102 says, give your tithes. God's kingdom, Economic 102 say, give your tithes. And you will see what he can do. Most people who are holding on to their tithes think that they have arrived. All God is saying to you is, I wish you knew. If you could only trust me and believe in me, you can see what I can do. You think you got it? Try me. Try him. He is faithful. If he has written it, you can count on him. You can take it to the bank, as they say here. You can take this one to the bank because God is faithful. God's economic 103, 1 Corinthians, 2 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 8 and 9. It reads, And God is able to bless you abundantly, so that in all things at all times, having all that you need, you will abound in every good work. As it is written, They have freely scattered their gifts to the poor, and their righteousness forever. Continue, verse 10. Go back to verse 7. I believe I, I skipped a verse. Second Corinthians chapter. Each of you should give what you have decided in your heart to give, not reluctantly or under force, for God loves a cheerful giver. Now, the whole passage is about the generosity. So, God's Economic 103 says, once you've given the tithes, you also need to be generous. Give cheerfully, or give generously. Be generous to the work of God. Be generous. In fact, those who have studied say that what the Israelites were required to give was actually more than 10%. The things that they were required to give, I think they say it was about up to 33%. But 
but it was more than 10%. So you give your tithe and then you give your offerings. 104. God's kingdom economic 104 is Proverbs chapter 19, verse 17. Whoever is kind to the poor lends to the Lord, and he will reward them for what they have done. Not only should you give your tithes, not only should you give generously, remember the poor. This is one of the things the Muslims, or the, uh, Muslims do daily. They make sure that they give something to the poor on a daily basis. Because they understand this verse. He who gives to the poor lends to the Lord and the Lord will reward you. One of five, and I took Greek. Uh, this Hebrew, Hebrew is 101, 102, 103, 104, 105, 106. In Greek, you go 201, 202, 203, 205, 206. So, this is God's economic 106 now. No, 105. Second Samuel chapter 24, oh, verse 24. Notice that it's advancing. But the king replied, this is David, the king replied to uh, Arona, no, I insist on paying for, you, for it. I will not sacrifice to the Lord, I will not sacrifice to the Lord my God a burnt offering that has cost me nothing. David says, I'm not going to take it for free because I need to give something God that has cost me something. So what's the point of God's economic 105, learn to give sacrificially. Learn to give sacrificially. Those of you who have been with us for long, you know that when we, were doing, when we did the first fundraising for us to be able to buy our, our building, this one, God asked me to give out my car. It was Lexus. 400 it was the best car I had. It was the best car I had ever driven. But the Lord says, I need it. So I gave God sacrificially because I did not have anything else like it. So I gave it sacrificially. So learn to give sacrificially. Be faithful in giving your tithes. Be generous in giving your offerings. Learn to give to the poor or lend to the poor and then learn to give sacrificially. Mark 12, verse 43. Mark 12, verse 43. Calling his disciples to him, Jesus said, Truly I tell you, this poor widow has put more into the treasury than all the others. Why? Because she gave all that she had. She had nothing else left. She took it from the pocket and that is all he gave. All she gave and Jesus said she has given more than everyone else. Because she gave it sacrificially. Nothing was left for her. Now 106. God's kingdom economics 106. Job 1 verse 20. And 21. Kimari, looks like this, this thing really cuts. You're really enjoying this. 107. At this, Job got up and tore his robes and shaved his head. Then he fell to the ground in worship. And he said, Naked I came from my mother's womb and naked. I will depart. The Lord gave and the Lord has taken away. May the name of the Lord be praised. Two things that you need to learn. Which the, the first one is actually connected to the first one, 101. Knowing the source of all. Job understood the source of his blessing. He said, God gave it to me. Because it came from him. But he says, but now he has 
taken it back. He says, naked I came, naked I will go. May the name of the Lord be praised. He did not get upset with God. He was willing to die naked. Just as he came out naked to this world. God's Economic 107 says, actually it's supposed to be 106, uh, no, yeah, 107. It says, I understand that what I have, God gave it to me, and God can take it away. And guess what? The point is, I will not take them to heaven. I will leave them here. God gave it, God can take it. And when you leave, you leave them here. So understand God's economics. Seek first his kingdom and his righteousness. Second, be faithful in your tithings. Fourth, remember the poor. Fifth, give sacrificially. Six, I knew that I was doing 106 instead of 107. 106 is actually saying, remember that God gives and God takes. Okay. 107 is actually saying that you will not take them out of this world. So 106 says, God give it and God can take it anytime. Understand that fact. And then 107 says, remember, you leave this world, you leave your material blessing. Uh, first, first, first Timothy chapter 6, verse 6 through 10. First Timothy chapter 6. It says, but godliness with contentment is great gain. For we brought nothing into this world, and we can take nothing out of it. But if we have food and clothing, we will be content with that. Those who want to get rich fall into temptation and a trap and into many foolish and harmful desires that plunge people into ruin and destruction. For the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. Some people eager for money have wandered from the faith and ruined themselves with many griefs. So, be content. Be content. Paul says, if you want to make, get more, you will be ruined. He says, if we have food and we have clothes, we are content. So the point here is that be content. Don't try to amass all the wealth. And in the end, when you exit, you exit with nothing. Now, Kobe Bryant, who died a few weeks ago, left millions and millions. He did not take them. So you can amass all that money, but you will not take them. So Paul says, be content. As long as you have food, you have clothes, be content. Don't go after it. In fact, it says the love of money is the beginning of all evil. Now, it doesn't say money is the beginning of, is the source of all evil. You know, some people, sometimes people make a mistake of saying, oh, money is, going, is the root of all evil. No, 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 no. It says the love of money. In Proverbs, it says whoever loves money will never have enough. If you love it, you will not have enough. Because you want more and more and more and more. You'll never be satisfied. But you need money. Don't love money, but you need what? Money. So make that distinction. So God's word will make you successful. It teaches you how you can be rich. It teaches you how you can be prosperous. When you learn those God's economics, according to how God wants it to be done, that is why people like Abraham was very rich. David was very rich. Godliness doesn't mean that you are poor. 
You can be godly as well as rich at the same time. Amen? Thank you. Let us all stand and worship team come. Are you enjoying this series on the word? You're learning something? Is anyone guilt? Is God's word making you guilty? It should, by the way, it should. Tapita, it should. If you come to church every day and you are going happy, 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 then I'm not doing a good job. Because God's word is supposed to make you happy sometimes, sometimes it's supposed to make you sad, bring convictions, because you say, Lord, I need to do something. I need forgiveness. So I don't know how God's word has spoken to you. I said at the beginning, let him who has the ear, let him hear what the Spirit is telling the church. So I'm not sure what God has told you. I'm not sure how God has convicted you. All I want to do right now is to give an altar call for anyone who wants to come and talk to God. In whichever way that God has spoken to you, that which you want to tell the Lord, whether to confess, whether to praise Him, whatever it is, just come. And if we can sing that song, he has done great things. Because when you reflect at your life, look at how true God's word is in your life. Look at how true. And I think of 1 Thessalonians chapter 5, verse 24 says, He who calls you, he is faithful and he will do it. I look back and I say, yes, he has done it. He called me and he has done it. All these years, 21 years at Upendo, and the previous years before coming to this country, he has been faithful. He deserves all the praises. He has done great things. I have served him sacrificially. I have given him sacrificially. And he has given me more than enough. Do you have something you want to say to the Lord? You have been faithful. Your word is true. Are you there or you are there saying, Lord, I missed that one. Or I did not know that one. Help me. The altar is open. He has done great things. He has done great things. He has done great things. Bless his holy name. He has done great things. Oh, 
would like to come forward and declare his goodness the altar is open or maybe you are to enable you to be faithful in whichever way maybe out of hearing this word you are convinced that you need to do something different and you need God to help you just come forward